Ten years ago, before 9-11, the U.S. defense budget was half the size that it is now. Ten years ago, before 9-11, there was no Department of Homeland Security. Had someone suggested that there ought to be one, you probably would have teased them for using a weird word like homeland. Ten years ago, before 9-11, you walked through a metal detector to get on an airplane, sure, but this was the kind of thing you'd only do maybe on a third date. Sometimes on your flight, even the pilots would keep the cockpit door open and you could see them work and you could see the world fly by through their windshield if you peered down the aisle. Before 9-11, the U.S. had troops based in Saudi Arabia. Before 9-11, the U.S. legal history of torture was of our government prosecuting people for that. Wartime was no excuse. Before 9-11, the National Security Agency, having access to everybody's emails and phone calls and texts and bank records and everything, would have been a scandal. Before 9-11, we did not have a new militarized intelligence bureaucracy that the Washington Post described as an additional 1,271 government organizations, 1,931 private companies, and an estimated 854,000 people holding top secret security clearances. Before 9-11, no one in politics and public life talked about Article Three courts, courts as called for under the Constitution, because those were just what courts were. We didn't have anything but Article Three courts. Why would we? Before 9-11, we didn't drop bombs using flying robots. Before 9-11, we had not lost 3,000 people in Lower Manhattan and at the Pentagon and in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. Before 9-11, we did not have 2.2 million Americans who are Iraq and Afghanistan veterans. And we did not have the attendant national promise to do right by them as a country in respecting their service. Before 9-11, we had not lost more than 6,000 of those veterans in our post-9-11 wars before U.S. forces finally found and killed Osama bin Laden. If you were a kid when 9-11 happened, it may be hard to imagine our country without all of these things in place. If you were an adult when 9-11 happened, you probably could never have believed that this is how we would have chosen to spend the decade after. Joining us now is a man who was a first responder on 9-11, who deployed to Iraq eight years ago yesterday, and who founded Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans, uh, Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America uh, when he came home. Paul Rykoff, thanks for being here. My pleasure, Rachel. Um, am I right? Eight years ago yesterday? Yeah, about that. About that. I know it's you went. I'm blurry after the last couple of days. <laughs> That's been, well, I was with you on Saturday night. Yeah, that was part of why I'm blurry. six in the morning. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I didn't think that I'd be up until three in the morning the next night with this news. Did you go down to Grand Zero? Yeah. What was yeah. it like? It was sobering. Yeah. I never thought, I was down there you know, almost 10 years ago, and I never thought I'd go back down there again to see people celebrating and cheering. They were chanting USA, USA, you know, right across from where people did it 10 years prior when Bush had the bullhorn. Yeah. So it was really sobering. It was something I'll never forget. And I think it was really moving because there were so many cops, firemen, and vets down there. And there was a real sense of community within that community. And it was really an unforgettable moment. Is it discordant at all to have this? It's, it's both celebratory and, as you say, sobering. Is there, is there, is, do you have, have a tension about the celebratory sense of it? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, you know, we're, we're really grounded in the reality of how much of our lives as a community of veterans has been dedicated to this moment. I mean, for the last 10 years, our brothers and sisters have been looking for this guy, have been hunting this guy, even when a lot of other Americans forgot about it and moved on to other things. And, and our community's paid a, a tremendous cost. So we think about the friends we lost, we think about our families, and we think about the folks who've been wounded, but we're proud. We're especially proud of the SEALs and all the operators involved in this operation who are absolutely incredible. And now the world's going to find out why we have such respect and, and admiration for them. You know, you have talked a lot, uh, your book actually, um, I think did a lot about this too. You've talked about a divide, maybe an inevitable divide between those who have made sacrifices either on 9-11 uh, or since and because of 9-11, uh, the divide between those folks and the rest of the country that has not had those sacrifices. Is there an opportunity at a milestone this big, at this particular milestone, to try to close that divide, to to get people beyond the slogans and the ribbons to honoring service and sacrifice in a, in a bigger way. Yes, definitely, and, and I hope so. And I, and I think that people need to remember how they feel now, remember how they felt last night, remember that unity, remember that, 
that, that sense of pride and carry it over. Memorial Day is coming up in a couple of weeks, mm -hmm. and we need folks to remember that day and keep this energy and keep this momentum and, and keep this unity because it's like nothing I've ever seen. The only time I've ever in my life seen unity like this was after 9-11, and that was for something very different. So I think we have an opportunity to harness that and to really support these folks and support our military and become stronger as a country. I wonder what you think about... Um we're sort of seeing a lot of talk about JSOC in the news yeah, now, yeah, right? Yeah. Uh, about Joint Special Operations Command, which has been around since 1980. It is not a new thing, yeah. but it is uh, newly empowered and obviously newly high profile for a secret branch of the military. Also, there seems to be a total integration, for, at least operationally, between CIA sort of paramilitary forces uh, and JSOC. And so we have kind of a fifth branch of the military now where we don't know who those people are and that we don't find out about the missions unless they end up with as high profile a mission, a high profile an outcome as we just had. How does that affect our ability to appreciate what the sacrifices that are being made if we're not even allowed to know about some of them? It, it completely insulates us from their sacrifice and their professionalism. I mean, we'll probably never know the names of the folks who are on that operation. Um, Delta, Dev Group, the SEALs, I mean, these folks are almost superhuman. I've seen them operate, I've seen them train, and it's like nothing else I've ever seen. Their tactical proficiency, their dedication, their entire life built for that moment where they might have that shot in Bin Laden is, is like nothing else I've ever seen. I mean, you can't even compare it. Olympic athletes, professional athletes, nothing like the, the prowess and, and the professionalism of what you see in these elite groups. And we'll probably never know the names of the operators involved. Do you worry about um, about accountability, about appropriate political engagement with what we're doing militarily to have so, uh, essentially a big secret branch in the military? Do you worry about the other, sort of the other side of that? I do, of course. Yeah. And, and I think that's why we need folks to understand what they are. We don't need to know their names, but we need to know what they do and what their capabilities are. And also understand this is the evolution of the modern battlefield. I mean, this is yeah. what is more effective going forward. You're not going to have tank battles in Western Europe. You're going to have small unit operations, and that's probably going to dominate what military engagement is like for the rest of our lifetime, or at least the near future. So we need to understand it, and we need to keep linked to it, and we need America to understand and appreciate how special these these folks are and how much we ask of them. Paul Rykoff, founder and executive director of Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America 